Let me welcome you to uh, our Peace and Justice Studies Association's 2020 virtual conference. Uh, we have uh, in, created three months of programming for you. Um, in September, we covered restorative justice. In October, we covered storytelling and social justice. And now in the month of November, we're covering polarization. Um, Peace and Justice Studies Association is my favorite group of people in the world. Um, we get together to talk about all of the things that I think are most important. And we're doing it online and it's just as meaningful as it's ever been. Um, when we designed this conference, we always knew that this November was going to be politically divisive and polarized, no matter who won, no matter who got the nomination on the Democrat side, we knew it was coming. And we thought it was really important to be able to make sure that we incorporated the substantive conversations, the moral conversations that we provided participants an opportunity to gain skills in addressing the conflicts and thinking about the world that we live in. And so it's the latter part really that brings us to the workshop that uh, we're all going to participate in today. Um, when we think about conflict, when we think about skills, when we think about what are we doing in this world, um, it's not always easy to immediately um, engage, um, but hopefully we come up with better uh, ideas about the things we can do and the steps we can take. Um, so in 30 seconds, uh, Elizabeth's going to jump right into that. Uh, th the only other thing I was going to say is whether or not you enjoy it tonight, check us out as an organization. Um, our membership's highly affordable. Um, I mean, I'm sure that the, this presentation is going to be awesome, but, you know, check us out, join us, um, look to our other programming. Uh, it's the last week of the conference, but we still have other presentations and a really kind of groundbreaking key, keynote happening this week where we're getting someone presenting from prison. And so I can't say enough good things about the remaining events. Please join us, please check us out. But before you do that, check out Elizabeth's friends. Uh, she's gonna be giving us this workshop and the floor is yours. Thanks, no work. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us um, for Listening Lab with Elizabeth. My name is Nipur. I work at Habitus Incorporated um, as a trainer and we train on a bunch of different cool topics, including negotiation, how to have difficult conversations, meeting design and facilitation, and now virtual meeting design. Um, and Elizabeth has recently joined our team and is a great, awesome trainer. So I'm excited to be running tech for her tonight for her training. Um, and there's just a few tech things to keep in mind. The first is um, we just wanna make sure that you can see and hear Elizabeth. So Elizabeth, if you could say a sentence and um, you all could give me a physical thumbs up that you can see and hear her. This is a sentence I want you all to hear. Excellent. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, and the second thing is we're going to try and stay away from the chat tonight and focus on the listening lap. But that being said, um, if you have any tech problems, you can't hear something, your audio video crashes, your child is on fire, please feel free to chat me and I will try to walk you as best as I can through the tech solutions. Um, so any tech questions before we get started? All right, well, have a great time. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nipur. It's such a luxury to have somebody who's a professional and who can hold the space for us with all the tech. So thank you for being here. This is just other logistics. We're scheduled for an hour and a half tonight. So we'll be done at, um, well, it'll be 6.30 Mountain Time. 7.30 Eastern time if you're on the East Coast. We're gonna take three breaks, each are gonna be five minutes. And there will also be three breakout groups where you'll be paired up. Um, you'll be randomly paired with people. So hopefully you'll get different people each time. And what I want to um, start by saying is we're gonna to try to stay very present to the listening. So we're gonna to try to remove all the distractions we can, which is why we're not, we're asking you to not use the chat to talk to each other. And we'll use the chat to get things to you. And obviously you can use a chat to direct message Nepur if you have any tech issues, but otherwise we really want you to have all of your attention and focus on the listening tonight and the space that we're in virtually. 
So the other thing is, um, I'm going to ask you all to trust me, to not have an agenda and to walk you through each step of what we're going to be doing today. So that's the other part of listening is just trusting that you'll get the signal and you'll know what we're doing as it happens. And finally, um, I want to make sure no one takes any notes. So if you are a note taker, you're going to have to surrender your paper and pen and put that away. And again, we just want to stay as focused as we can on the active physically hearing. There it is, just surrendering the pen and piece of paper and just staying present and listening to what's happening now. So also to stay present, I just want to walk us through some really quick grounding. Um, we're going to just stay in this moment. I want to give everyone an opportunity to just wipe off the day, whatever is accumulated from this week that is a long week, even though it's Tuesday. I want you to shake it off if you need to. Anything that's coming to mind that you would normally be bringing into this space, I just want you to let go of that. Also, if you're already in the future, and planning ahead, I want you to take that to-do list, that grocery list, and just put it on the shelf for now and trust that you'll be able to come back to it at the end of this hour and a half. And then finally, I'm going to ask everyone, we're going to just drop into our bodies. So if you find it helpful, you're welcome to close your eyes. And listening is fundamentally an act of receiving. So we want to open ourselves up to whatever comes out in the present moment and be open to receiving it as it is. And so that's why we've put the past behind us. We're setting the future to the future self an hour and a half from now. We're gonna stay present to now. Um, I want you to think about the sensation of the seat you're sitting in. What does that seat feel like? What does it feel like? What's the temperature in the room you're in? I want you to get both of your feet on the ground if you can and really tap into that feeling of the connection of your feet to the floor. And then I'm gonna draw your attention to something else in your body. And when I do it, I don't want you to change it. I just want you to observe it as it is. So I want you to drop in, notice your breathing, notice the pace, how deep is it? Does it change now that you've drawn your attention to it? And now the last thing I wanna do for grounding is just listen to the sound of my voice. The way we listen to music, we listen to the pitch, we're listening to the speed at which I'm speaking. You're listening it through your speakers. Those sound waves are going into your ears. And just get a sense for like what that sound is like. Be present to just the melody, the sound, the pitch of my voice as we continue throughout this hour and a half. And if you ever feel yourself leaving this present moment, you can anchor into your breath and you can come back to just the sound of the voice that you're hearing in your computer. Okay. Well, so now that we're all in this space, thank you for dropping into your bodies and being in the present with me. Napur is going to start the video that we're all going to watch. And this is especially important to not take notes during. So we're practicing just listening, just watching the video. The rabbit listened. The Rabbit Listened by Corey Doerfeld. One day, Taylor decided to build something. Something new. Something special. Something amazing. Taylor was so proud. But then, out of nowhere, things came crashing down. The chicken was first to notice. Cluck, cluck. What a shame. I'm so sorry, sorry, sorry this happened. Let's talk, talk, talk about it. Cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking. So the chicken left. Next came the bear. Arr, arr, ha 
how horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's shout about it. Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
And Elizabeth, can you just remind everyone how much time we're going to be in the breakout rooms for? Yes, we'll have about five minutes in this breakout room. So about two and a half minutes, we'll ping you to let you know it's time to switch. All right, please accept the invite when you get it. Okay, and do we have anyone else left in this room? Um, oh, no, they're good. Do you okay. need me to go into a room report or is it? It's even. Okay, so I can stay here with you. Yeah. Okay, you're in the recording back on, perfect. So welcome back everyone. Thank you for doing that breakout session. Um, now, um, we are going to talk about the rabbit. I'm going to ask Nipur here what she noticed from the rabbit. Um, I noticed a few different things. One was that um, the rabbit, unlike any of the other animals, didn't actually say any words. Um, and that was really interesting. In the beginning, um, the rabbit didn't say any words. And the other thing that I noticed was... Um, applicable to Taylor in particular, which is that he um, or she, I guess he didn't, um, he waited for Taylor to decide what they were going to do. The rabbit didn't quite tell him what they were going to do like all the other animals, um, waited for Taylor to tell him. Great, thank you, Nupur. So Nupur, if you could also pull up the, the pictures, I, I took pictures of like all the, the, the images of the rabbit. And then also I put the transcript of what was said during those pages with the rabbit. And we're gonna reality test what Nupur perceived and remembers of the rabbit against what we actually saw in the video. So I am in this video, in, in the images, we can see that in fact, the rabbit has not said any words. We don't see any images of the rabbit looking like they're talking. Um, we do see Taylor, um, like the rabbit waiting for Taylor to decide what to do. And then if you could go to the next slide with the text, if we look at the text, any, any words that were spoken were spoken by Taylor and we don't actually um, see that the rabbit speaking any words. So we can reality check that in fact, the rabbit did not say any words and the other animals did, some of them did. And in terms of Taylor's gender, when I did first get introduced to this story, the author did say that she intentionally left Taylor genderless. There's no actual official gendering of Taylor in the book. Other than that, he's in, uh, or Taylor, they are in a blue jumper. And so what I want to point out in this, thank you, Nupur, you can take the slides down now, um, is that we, what we hear, what happened and what we, what we hear when we listen, what we perceive are two different things. They can be. And oftentimes what we listen and hear tells us more about ourselves than it does about the subject. So in this case, when we know that when I'll, I'll speak for myself, I also notice that the rabbit didn't say any words. And what that says about me, if I'm listening to both the subject and myself, is that I'm a very verbally communicative person. So I do notice, I do listen for words and sometimes I miss body language. And if there are no words, I also notice that in myself is a little uncomfortable. I also notice in myself that I projected onto, onto the rabbit that the rabbit was encouraging Taylor to rebuild. And we actually don't ever see the rabbit say any words about do it, you can do it. You don't see the rabbit pick up a block and try to make it happen again. So what that says about me, if I'm listening on the level of what's happening to the subject and listening to myself is that I'm someone who really values encouragement. And that maybe what that means is encouragement for me can be just listening and letting me do my thing. And so what I want you to take from this exercise and listening is an uncoupling of listening from other things that are happening. So we can listen and listening is neutral. When you listen to someone, it doesn't mean you're encouraging them. It doesn't mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean you disagree with them. It doesn't mean you're discouraging them. Those are two separate things. The act of listening and the act of encouraging someone can be two separate things. They can be intertwined, but it is possible for listening to be a neutral act. And it is possible to just sit with somebody and let them go through their process, let them decide what they're gonna do. And listening to them doesn't mean that I agree or disagree with them.
I'm just there building connection, building the conditions for understanding, which is what listening is so important for. So now we're gonna go ahead and I think um, we're scheduled to take a break. Um, so we have five minutes. This is the time to take a bio break. If you listen to your bladder, listen to your thirst, listen to your hunger and take care of that. We're gonna come back um, right at, we'll say, we'll say 535 and then we'll get into the next portion of the lab. And if you have to leave, you're welcome to come and go as you please. I designed this so that it's an open time since it's late in the evening for everyone. Thank you everyone, see you in five minutes. Thanks, Napur. That was perfect. I want to just notice that even when you, since you couldn't introduce yourselves, how we ended up asking where everybody was anyway. Um, and I think for me, I was more curious since I didn't know than if you had all just said that at the beginning. So I'm really enjoying the delight of knowing where you all are. So back to kind of what we were wrapping up at the end before our break about decoupling listening from other things. This is especially important with polarization because I think often we'll listen to somebody who has a very different opinion than us and we can be offended, we can be hurt, we can feel like if we don't argue with them, if we don't stand up for our release in that moment that we're somehow out of integrity. And I wanna to convey to all of you that you can be in your integrity and listen to someone you vehemently disagree with. That can happen. And really the only way to build that relationship and understanding is to start from a place of listening and listening in that neutral way where that's all you're doing. You're not trying to convince them to your side. You're not trying to change their mind. You're not judging them. You're just hearing what they're saying for what they're saying. So now what we're gonna do in this section, I'm gonna just go over a couple tips for how to listen in the virtual space. Since now we're all on Zoom, we're disembodied heads. And there are some things that I wanna draw your attention to that could maybe improve how you listen in this space. So there are three categories of things to think about when you're listening virtually. The first is your environment. So first thing you wanna pay attention to is your lighting. You wanna make sure that the lighting isn't coming from behind you. So if you're sitting in front of a window and the light is behind you, that light will change also. It means that we can't see your face. There's shadows. So you always wanna make sure the light is in front of you. And so you can see it in my glasses. My ring light is in front of me, which means that I also have to pay attention to kind of just slightly angle my face so that I'm not getting the ring light in their reflection if I, since I have glasses. Um, the other thing about your space is you wanna consider your background. So you don't want it to be too cluttered, too busy. Again, you don't want there to be a lot of light in the back. And so far, it looks like everyone's backgrounds are great. You could also do what Morp Napur is modeling for all of us, which is having a virtual background. That can be a really good option as well. And then finally, you wanna pay attention to what you're wearing. So like I have a white background. I should not be wearing white in any of my Zoom meetings because I will just fade into my backdrop. So you'll see like I have different colors on. I like, personally, I like to play with texture and I also try to avoid really crazy patterns. So nice people can't see that or can be distracting. Um, so then the second category is yourself. When you're speaking on Zoom, what you think about First thing is you really wanna have, even in person, you want your shoulders squared to the person you're listening to. So often for me, my bad habit is I cross my legs and then sometimes I'm slightly not pointed at the person I'm speaking to or who's speaking to me. And I always have to remember to open up my chest and shoulders so that I'm square. And that's really important with my computer. So if I have multiple screens, it's really important that the screen that your camera is on is the one that you're squared towards. There are some people who have like a second monitor and they'll be talking <laughs> to the people over here because they can see them. But now I actually don't feel as connected because you're talking not to me in the same way if you're squared. The other thing is where you're looking. So same, same thing about like the side screen, but also some people have this idea and I don't think any of you have done this, but they think if they look right at the camera that this is a better experience for people. It is not. <laughs> you know that if you can see my eyes looking at you that I'm not looking at your face, I'm looking at a dot and the camera and a little light that shows my camera's on. So do look at the faces on your screen and everyone can understand that you're looking at them. And that's a really important indication, again, that you're listening, that you're present, which is why having your video on 
is actually a really helpful way to remind people that you're present, that you're here, that you're listening to them. And then um, finally, the thing you should, second, third, fourth, third, third thing about yourself to pay attention to is where you put your hands. So it does feel weird because normally my hand gestures would happen like more down here. But if I'm, if I want my face to take up more space in the tile, I need to bring my hands up. And hand gestures are really helpful because it makes the image a little more dynamic than no hands. And also evolutionarily, humans are actually, uh, our brains are always looking for signals that we're dealing with other humans. So we have a specific part of our brain that can identify faces of other humans. There's also a specific part to identify hands. These are very human. And evolutionarily, we are more relaxed when we can see the other person's hands because we know there's not a fist behind their back. They don't have a weapon, right? If I can see your hands, I feel just uh, like as an animal safer. And also you're communicating that you're not texting, that you're not doing something else. If my hands are here, I have completely surrendered my attention to you. You know, without a doubt that I am here, I'm looking at you and that's all I'm doing because you can see my hands. So I encourage people to try to get their hands up into their screen when they're listening or talking to someone just to give that signal because we, we, we usually get a lot of other signals in person, right? There's body language, we're in a space, there's sound, not everyone's muted. But when those things go away, we need new sensory cues and bringing your hands up into the Zoom like tile that you're in can just provide that extra cue when we're feeling that lack of other stimulation that we're used to having from in person. And then with your facial expressions as well. So like you'll see Nippur is like smiling at me. I actually really am feeding off that energy, right? Like when she's smiling at me, I'm like, oh, I'm like, she's listening and like I'm making her smile and that feels really good. And so be aware of like, you know, when you're on Zoom, this is a great chance because you get to see your own facial expressions. You can practice them. And it's a really, and it's another signal like the hands to people virtually that you're paying attention, that you're there. So you can move your eyebrows, smiles, you know, you can like draw back, but being a little bit more expressive because the rest of your body is cut off. I can only see what's up here. And so the more we capitalize on what we can signal up here, the more engaged people will feel we are. And that goes to the third category. So we wanna think about how our audience is perceiving us. And so you want to, if you can, do things to indicate that you're listening. So the nodding the purr's doing, the agreement finger, the hand gestures, the facial expressions, all of those are efforts to tell the person who's speaking, I hear you, I'm here, I'm reacting to you. And if it's one-on-one, -on -one, that's a great opportunity to unmute yourself and do the mm-hmmms, aha, uh -huh, oh, really, what? Those things make a huge difference. I know when I've been leading Zoom rooms, I'll often ask people to unmute themselves because I've said a joke and wanted laughter and then I see laughter, but I can't hear it. And it's very dissatisfying. So do consider, you know, if you're in a small group and, they're, and you're in a quiet space, taking advantage of also those verbal sounds and noises to indicate that you're listening. Then that um, brings us also to the nods. So nodding is a very effective way to show that you're listening to someone when you're muted, when all you have is your shoulders up to communicate that you're listening. So now that we've gone through those just quick tips and tricks to making sure that you're a better listener in the virtual space, we're gonna do another breakout group. And same as the last one, the person whose first name is alphabetically first, you'll be the speaker first. And this time when you're speaking, you're answering the question, what do I need to feel heard? And you are telling your listener, these are the things that I need to feel heard. So it helps me if I can see your hands. It helps me when you nod. I like it when you're unmuted. I, I, I really like someone to ask me questions. I like to have what I say reflected back to me. That's what the speaker is going to do. And the listener, what you're going to do is you're going to try to do what they ask for. So if someone says, hey, you know, it makes a big difference to have the hands up, you put your hands up, you try to give it to them, and then they're kind of coaching you through how to do what they need to feel heard in the virtual space. And I'm going to give you guys, because we're ahead of time, I'm going to give everyone three minutes to talk about what they need to feel heard and for your listener to practice and receive the honor of getting to be coached through exactly what someone needs. And as a speaker, I want you to also appreciate and enjoy receiving listening the way you're asking it to happen. 
and then we're going to switch. So we'll, we'll broadcast that and then you'll have that minute buffer to come back. So Nippur is going to whisk us away into breakout rooms now and um, get ready to talk about what you need to feel heard and to listen to each other. Okay, and we've got, okay, everyone, welcome back. So now when everyone gets back in the room, we're letting everyone load. Um, I'm gonna ask three people to just share what that was like for them. So anyone who'd like to share to the big group, you can go ahead. Well, M Maria's not back, because, and that's who my partner was. Um, oh, where so is I'd is she still in the room? Is she still in the? Oh, she's been dropped off the call. So maybe she'll come back. Um, but there's no waiting for her. You can go ahead. But we were totally riffing off of each other, even though that wasn't exactly the assignment. But I was like, um, she's back. Oh. Um, like there's this thing that happens where if somebody's listening just to listen to the part where they want to argue with, that doesn't make me feel like I've really been heard. And if people just summarize back to me what they heard me say, then I know they got the words, but I don't necessarily feel heard. But like if the person like hears me say something, then they react to and incorporate it like like in a jam session. And like and so then we actually were pinging and ponging back and forth, like with the part where it's like listening to be complimentary, like how do I either express that I appreciate what I just heard or help make this like medley um, it is something beautiful, right? Yeah. Wim, thank you for that wonderful musical um, metaphor. I think that's something that if you like jazz or you're a musician who likes to like do jam sessions with people, that satisfaction when you're playing a beat or you're doing something and someone can add to it and compliment it, that does feel different when you're feeling heard when they weave it into what they're doing too. Um, so thank you, Wim. Anyone else want to share what their session was like? Um, I didn't have a go. I was with um, Helen Franz and um, I think we, I started off and I didn't really know what I liked. So I just talked about what I didn't like. Um, and she was absolutely lovely and was just such a great listener and um, talked about how she didn't like all, what she didn't like also. So I kind of felt like um, uh, validated, which is really nice. And then I found out that she uh, is also Filipino and I just felt like this, knowledge from an elder it was super beautiful so i just wanted to send a big shout out to your mom elizabeth because she's she's pretty awesome so thanks Aww. thank you jennifer and thank you for appreciating my mom i appreciate you too mom i'm gonna cry that's so beautiful and welcome i guess now we know there's more filipinos in this room <laughs> i always am like how is such a tiny island how is everyone everywhere when it's this tiny on the map but somehow so thank you, Jennifer. Um, anyone else would like to share? Oh, and thank you, Mom, for being so awesome. So you said two things, the, the light thing. I like that you said, don't look at it, because I always wondered where I was supposed to look. And when Shira and I were talking, you had said about using the hands when you're listening. And it's like, yeah, that's not going to work for me because I don't, when I'm listening, I'm not, using, when I talk, I use my hands, but when I'm listening, I don't, you know, so, but it was helpful to talk. And actually we both have Indian roots. So <laughs> Zoom randomly pairing based on <laughs> ethnicity. Wow. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Swasi. That's really helpful because I do, I think using hands when you speak makes sense, but yeah, when you're listening. I, you don't, especially when you're listening, you don't want to do this thing. This is like, I've checked out, I'm done. Or like this thing, oh God, please stop. So really hands, I guess, and listening are not as helpful, but thank you for that. Um, okay, so we've done our, our share backs. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time together. Time flies when you're having fun listening. And I just want to recap some of the things um, that we learned. Oh, and, and I guess what I want to reflect back to is part of this exercise, um, asking yourself, what do I need to feel heard? 
we often don't ask ourselves that. And I think it, we want to start our listening with ourselves because we under our understanding of ourself improves our listening in all other areas, right? If I know that when I listen to something, I tend to feel this way, then I know that that's about me, maybe not about the subject, right? Like if I know that I'm delighted when I talk to another Filipino, I might be like, okay, they may be not as wonderful as they think they are, but I'm super biased and have the rose colored, you know, lenses on because they're Filipino. So now I'm just like so in love and I'm going to enjoy that. Um, so it's good to know these things about ourselves and asking yourself what you need to feel heard is important. Also telling the people in your life what you need. So if you have partners, coworkers, friends, what people need from listening is different. And I think, you know, Wim, having your example that you, Maria, did more of a riffing that you didn't do like a three minute, three minute, you did more riffing. That's how like listening can look different for different people. So asking yourself, what do I need? And then accepting that what you need may not be what someone else does. So ask them what they need to feel heard. And doing this exercise is a great way to build that relationship with the people in your life that maybe you don't feel heard by. Um, I think oftentimes we think that they're not listening to us, but it might just be because they don't know how to let us know that they're listening. So I have friends who just deadpan face, no reaction when I'm talking and that's their way of listening. They just want like no, they just want no signaling. They just want to be like, I'm here. That's it. I'm just here. And I have to be like, hey, can you like move when I'm talking to you? Can you nod? I, I like the uh-huhs and the uh-hahs and the mm -hmm's. And I had to let them know that because they did genuinely want me to feel hurt. They just didn't know how. And then I reciprocated that and found out that they actually don't like my nodding because they're like, it's distracting, Elizabeth. Like, why do you keep moving? And I'm like, okay, I'll just not move when you're talking because that's your style. Right. So this is a really helpful thing to know that everyone has different listening. And that also is part of what happens in polarization is there is this misunderstanding. I think when you brought up that if someone feels like you're listening to have a counterpoint or to say they're wrong or to put your opinion in, that's not listening. That's that's you're, you're getting ready to argue. You're getting defensive. And again, listening is a neutral act. We listen. We hear them out. And doing that does not mean we agree. I can hear you out on something that's deeply offensive to me and still be in my integrity. And I can decide if I want to tell you I'm offended and if I feel like you're going to listen to me or I can decide not to. I can also just walk away and take the listening and learn like, oh, so that's what that perspective is. Interesting. I disagree, but now maybe I understand it better. And that may serve me in relationships where I do want to have that conversation, where I do want to have more of a back and forth. So um, we, we did the rabbit listened. We got to see all the different ways the animals tried to listen to Taylor. And we saw that the way that worked the best was what the rabbit did, which was just there sitting with Taylor through whatever Taylor needed. We checked our perceptions of what we observe in those animals. And we reality checked that against what actually happened. We were in a situation because we're in a lab where we could go back and say, did the rabbit actually not speak? And we could test that. We could check that out. And we could, we learned that what we observe in our subjects often tells us more about ourselves than others. Then I'm um, trying to think we did, oh, we did the Zoom tips and tricks to so learn new ways to use virtual space and how to listen. And if you want more information about running good virtual meetings, Napur is gonna talk about that at the end. And then we also went over what we need to feel heard and we got to give each other a really delightful treat where we got to share what we need to be heard and we got to give that to each other in a real beautiful present way. So now we're gonna come to the end and we're gonna have you go in one more breakout room. We'll see if Zoom pairs us by ethnicity again. <laughs> And um, I want you again, alphabetical person goes first, and we're going to share one of the main thing, our, our number one takeaway from this time we've spent together. And then we come back, we'll do one more big group share. So um, Nupur is going to whisk us away into breakout rooms. And again, just share with your partner, what is a takeaway you've gotten from your listening lab? And mom, right? Is she stuck again? Yeah, she's just frozen, but she's gone. She's got she's got an old computer. I need to like Aw, that was so nice that they got two Filipinos in one room. Aww.
I know. I actually paired everyone manually. <laughs> oh, you did? Oh, so you're oh, you're the genius behind it. That was perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, because I just wanted to make sure that no one got double partnered. Perfect. And like you can't make sure of that if you auto partner. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I wanted to give you the random option because I wasn't sure how many people would be here. That makes sense. Yeah. If there were more, I put it, I probably would have autoed. Yeah. Um, and then there would have been like a greater chance that no one would repeat. Perfect. Well, thank you for like mixing it up. Cause yeah, I think in a small group, it's nice to get to different people. So yeah, it'll be nice to see what they get. Wow. Yeah. That time went by really fast. So you yeah. have of time. We have so much time at the end. I might do like a little, I was going to do like a really short closing, but I might just do a little bit more like breathing grounding, reflecting, because we have so much time and then some Q and A right at the end. Yeah. And then I'll be late for my training. <laughs> be like, sorry. Yeah, it'll be great. And, you know, there's always um... one. So we're going to do what we did in our last round. We'll have three people share their takeaways to the whole group. So whoever would like to share their takeaways you can, you can go ahead. Um, so I think what we discussed, I was uh, with Helen in this group, and it was really interesting because we were talking about how um, uh, listening varies from person to person and also from culture to culture and uh, how that, how, um, what might work for one person or even for one culture uh, might not really work for everyone else. And that just creates a lot of responsibility on the listener to be aware of the person uh, he or she or they are talking with and to be um, respectful of where they come from and what they need in their lives and what they're trying to communicate and how, we, how that should be responded to. So it isn't just about improving listening skills in like one context for ourselves, but it's also about improving listening skills for different people and tailoring it to those requirements. Thank you, Shreya. And so I have a follow up question for you since we now know that you're in India and you're in a small village. And I guess the question I have for you is, can you give us an example of how, you know, if we wanted to listen to you and be culturally responsive to where you're from, how could we do that? Um, honestly, in, in India, in the Indian context, listening is very quiet. Um, there isn't a lot of like what you were saying, like nodding or mm -hmm, or just in general, it's just quiet and as quiet as possible. However, that's not necessarily how I like to be listened to just because um, one in the Zoom context, it's really difficult to see if the other person is listening at all in the absence of those, those cues. And two, I think also from my interactions with other people all around the world, I think my need ha needs have changed as well because actually this is also what we were discussing in the breakout room that a lot of the time the, the culture that we are in is not necessarily, um, does not necessarily dictate our needs. It's more of the structure that we already have or the conditions that we've already been kind of trained to think about in that way. And we might realize that our needs might be a little bit different from that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, that was really helpful. Um, anyone else wanna share their takeaway? I can just go really quick. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Um, so I got paired up with Swasti and we had a really nice conversation. And uh, I basically just started by remarking on how like, I love thinking more deeply about listening in general. Like it's such a, it's such a, it, it's a daily universal everyday can't escape it sort of thing that we're all constantly engaging in whether we know it or not and I just love doing these intentional exercises and like really thinking about it a little bit more and I'm really excited to learn more and then um and she's on the board of this organization 
participation in the Peace, uh, Peace and Justice Studies Association. So I learned a little bit about that from her, um, but also just relating, listening back to like how it's such a core skill for bringing about peace and justice. And yeah, so I'm really interested in going deeper and hopefully being able to like teach, like continue learning because <laughs> it's a lifelong thing to, to you, you can never be like the perfect listener. Um, so continue learning and share that with others so that we can all be better listeners. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate that. And it is something, you know, we're actually listening. We listen more than we talk in our lives, right? We got two ears and one mouth. The mm -hmm. listening never stops. <laughs> yeah. So it is something that for me, it's been really transformational to go back and look more deeply at it as a foundational skill. And also something that, you know, is instinctual for us. We're built to listen more to speak than we speak. And we do actually listen more than we speak. And it's just a matter of being aware of that and paying attention to how wonderful listening can be. Any, any other takeaways anyone would like to share before we wrap up? I uh, have appreciated this focus on listening because I do some stuff with cultural humility. And at the core of that is about understanding and in going through this exercise, I, was, I thought, you know, I need to incorporate that into this because we can't understand if we haven't listened. You know, and you're right. You know, I would tell students all the time, just listening doesn't mean you agree or disagree, but you can't even know that you disagree with something or someone until you've heard them and understood what they're trying to say. So this, this whole session has got, the thing I'm taking away is it's something I should think about a for myself, because when you say we listen more than we talk, I don't know if that's true about me, because <laughs> I talk a lot. Um, but then secondly, I'm thinking about ways that I could incorporate some stuff into the stuff that I do with cultural humility. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Swasti. Okay, so um, unless any, does anyone else want to share any more takeaways before we start? Sure. Go ahead, Wim. So. I shared with Jennifer that I'm uh, horrible at following directions. And in some ways, that's a reflection of being a bad listener. Um, and in other ways, it's probably a reflection of my gender. And biologically, I'm not sure my ears work the same as everybody else's ears, um, which in some ways is a reflection of socialization and genetics and, and in other ways, just a bad joke. But what I was distracted by with children's story, I shared with her, which is that I have like my focuses on things and I was like looking for the part where there was this thing happening and I was like, where's the consent? The, the, like, I, and, and I get that a children's book is probably not going to use like a dozen drawings to show where non-verbally it was communicated that occupying that space is okay or whatever but like I got actually pretty distracted by that but I'm also simultaneously very very curious about the non-verbal communication since it's used to justify so much from like when you're man spreading on like public transportation and somebody wants to sit down and how you communicate whether or not like the person's allowed to be there versus, you know, um, you'd like to sit there or whatever it might be and what the social expectations are. But then the part that I didn't share, which is even more on my mind, because everything on my mind is all about forgiveness, is about how people hear the cues that they have or have not been forgiven and how we relate that in other kinds of communication. So, um, and maybe that's the biggest part for me where um, it relates to polarization is that when we have radical divides and don't even know how to talk to each other through difference, we don't even know how to let people know that like, it's okay, I still love you. And when we're really angry, we have a really hard time hearing the words like, I love you, or it's okay. Like, we don't have to agree on this. Um, and maybe that was the biggest surprise that I had when I started working as a mediator was that I learned that when somebody made an apology in session, like, I'm sorry this happened, I needed to interrupt that so I could repeat it <laughs> from a different location and make sure that the other party heard it and then ask. So that you, you've just got an apology. How do you feel about that? And like nine out of 10 times, the person would be like, there was no apology. And then it would be like, I heard you say, I'm sorry for, 
this, this, and this, did I get that right? And then like that repetition would bring it into the room. Um, it's kind of like the fact checking that you had. And I think sometimes we need to interrupt stories to make sure that our details are correct or when we're facilitating events that we need to do that part. Like my friend Swasti does for me about saying like somebody's written something in the chat and you wanna make sure that the questions get asked and stuff when we do these sessions because it can be there, but it might just be a pink elephant until somebody asks about it. Right. Thank you, Wim. And that does remind me to bring up that the other part that I like about that children's story, and I think what's really helpful with the animals is to understand that, you know, the chickens clucking because that's what chickens do, right? And the chicken is trying to show support by saying you should talk about it because that's what the chicken does to feel better. It talks about it, it clucks. And that's where we do need to have that exchange. We can't expect people to know exactly what we need. And I mean, Taylor in this just was unresponsive and the chicken took that as, okay, he doesn't want to, or you know, they don't want to talk and the chicken left. And I think we have people in our lives who come to us and we may feel like they're being abrasive, like stop telling me to talk about it. And we can one, listen to them and be like, maybe this is how you this is what would be helpful for you. And then I have to set, I have to communicate myself and say, you know, it's not helpful for me to talk about it. What's helpful for me is what the snake said, or I'm more of an elephant or I'm more of a bear, but we do have to communicate ourselves. We can't expect people to just read our minds and we don't have to judge people for just doing what they do. I mean, that chicken is gonna cluck, it's the chicken. And it's up to us to decide how we interact with that chicken and what we tell the chicken when that comes up. So um, we're gonna wrap up. Oh, Jennifer, go ahead. Please, Jennifer, if you wanna share something, please go ahead. I just wanted to um, share one little story. I don't really know exactly how it relates, but I feel like it does. Um, I had a teacher about a decade ago who came to me in my office and she was um, very disturbed by one of her students who was just not listening, um, you know, and, and he fidgets, you know, and he doodles. And, and, it, and he doesn't look at me and, and I'm struck because he's just not listening. And, um, and I remember that story now. And I think sometimes um, one of my fears um, in this new world that we live in is that we project what we think listening should look like onto somebody else. Um, and then we say, um, the dominant, you know, the, the dominant new COVID hegemony of this is how you're supposed to listen in the box, you know, and I think I'm, I get, I get a little bit scared about that. Um, and I, and I think about um, different people's comfort zones and stuff. And I, and I don't know why, but I think um, I, that, that story just kind of popped into my head and I wanted to share that with everybody. And I also just wanted to thank you, Elizabeth. I found this, um, this session really insightful. So cheers. Thank Thanks very much. I, I really appreciate that story because it comes back to the point of this listening lab. You did not come in here and I did not lecture you on the right way to listen because there isn't one. And you got into pairs because what works for you doesn't always work for everybody. And now that we're paying attention to our listening, I think, Jennifer, if anybody's ever in that situation where the teacher's like, you're not listening to me, or, you know, you're a chicken and you're talking to a snake or you're talking to a bear and the bear's screaming and you're like, why are you doing that? I just want to talk about it, right? We need to be forthright and communicate what we need and then invite that from other people as well. And so when you're in those situations where you're like, I don't really feel heard, or the other person's like repeating themselves, like you're not listening. That's a great time to just speak to listening, right? Ask that question, what do you need to feel heard? And then share what you need. Because often what happens is we do wanna to listen to each other. Like my friend who just stone cold doesn't move when he listens to me, like he is listening. He's trying to make sure I feel heard, but he didn't know that I needed the nods. I didn't know my nods were distracting to him. And we have to be able to speak to that to learn that because we can't read each other's minds. So it's a wonderful story because if the teacher had asked the student, I'm a doodler and I know that I would doodle my notes so that I could capture what the teacher was saying and remember it better. I was just listening in a different way or like I used to knit in class and they should be like, you're not paying attention. I'm like, no, like I'm paying more attention because every time you're saying something, I'm knitting it into this hat. I put that on my head and I think about it. <laughs> and that's like way that I'm listening that was unique, but I had to tell them that, you know, and you can start that way. You can say, you know, I'm in your class and I'm a doodler. And I promise you I'm listening and I'm gonna have my head down, but this is my way of really taking in everything you're sharing. And we have to be more assertive about that. And then we are, 
invite that reciprocity. What do you need to feel heard, teacher? What do you need so that you feel appreciated for all the time you're putting into virtual learning and COVID? So those are questions we can ask each other. So thank you, Jennifer. We're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Um, Nupur is going to tell you a little bit about how you can do more learning with us. And then I'll do a closing for all of us and then we'll have a QA and a if anyone wants to stay. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, it was really lovely getting to meet all of you and um, just be here. Elizabeth is a great facilitator and I'm really happy and lucky to share workspace with her every day. Um, part of the thing, one of the things that we wanted you to notice is that communication is a curated experience. And it is really important to learn how to curate that for yourself and for people around you, especially for people that are in industries that are in professions that focus so much on learning, listening, reflecting, problem solving, et cetera. Um, and so a few different ways in which, um, you know, you have been, this experience has been curated for you today is um, one, Elizabeth ran a wonderfully beautifully led session um, that had really specific instructions and really specific asks and that guided everyone and modeled how we guide other people um, into listening. The other thing was your tech was taken care of, uh, of for you. Um, and that is, I can attest as a trainer in my daily life that that is a great luxury to have someone else worry about the tech. Um, and then the third one is just there is a community, there is a resource where now all of you have gotten to know each other. We plan these breakout rooms so that everyone kind of meets everyone in one way or another. Um, and so now you have these people to lean on and say, oh, Shreya, I, you know, I heard you said this great thought at the workshop. I forgot what it is. Can you remind me what it is? I want to show someone how to listen to me or whatever that may be. Um, but the core of this actually comes from a lot of different learning, listening, pedagogy, and um, Elizabeth and I both work at Habitus Incorporated, which is a training and facilitation company. So we do this for a living, um, which is training people on how to communicate better, stronger, more effectively in order to create healthy relationships. Um, and I'm really excited to be here because I get to share some of the work that we've been doing and are going to be doing in the future, which is there, like I said earlier, there's three topics that Habitus teaches on. And the first one is negotiation. And that is just like, negotiation is a nasty topic in the common world. It is icky. You people think of suits and lawyers and dark rooms and shady deals. Um, and there's a whole beautiful world of on the table, light filled collaborative negotiation. Um, that focuses on how can we actually each get what we want and preserve a really healthy relationship. Um, and that is a skill <laughs> and takes practice and coaching and guidance. Um, and that's one of the things we teach. The second one is how do you have difficult conversations? And how do you have them in the workplace? How do you have them in your family? How do you have them with your spouse and your kids? Um, how do you tell someone that I know, Jennifer, that when you said that you, you know, want to leave my workshop early. I know your intention wasn't to hurt my feelings. And here's the impact that it had on me. It made me feel like I wasn't giving you value, et cetera, et cetera. How do you have these conversations and walk away at the end and say, I wanted to tell you because I care about preserving this relationship. And as long as we continue to sweep things under the rug, which I have tons of experience with because I am an Asian woman, um, when, as long as we continue to sweep things under the rug, we never get a chance to strengthen those relationships. Um, and then the last one is meeting design and facilitation. So if you've noticed um, in our COVID times, a lot of us have shifted to virtual teaching, virtual meetings, virtual classes. And that is not gonna lie, excruciating in many, many ways. Um, but the ways that we can make it less excruciating are to actually curate an experience for your attendees, for your listeners, for your class. Um, and we've developed a bunch of courses and resources on how you can actually do that. Um, so check out Habitus, follow us on social media if you want free content. Um, the Habitus mission is actually to get content accessible and available for free in the hands of people that are impacting change in the world. Um, because when you have tools that strengthen relationships and strengthen communication, you shouldn't charge for that because um, that's not how we grow the world. 
And so um, we were putting out a bunch of free content and we would love for you to see it and to reach out if you have questions. Um, so I'm gonna drop them in the chat. And if you have any questions about what we do, feel free to ask, but if not, I'm gonna hand it back to Elizabeth. Okay, thank you, Nafor. So <clears throat> I'm going to uh, uh, amend the rule on don't use the chat. If you would like to stay in touch with each other, you're welcome to put your emails in the chat now. And then I'll just, we'll just assume that if you're putting your email in the chat that you can send to like any of us reaching out to you after this. There's three asks um, that I'm gonna ask you for this, um, for our time together. And Nipur will also paste those into the chat as well. The first is um, I do this listening lab a lot. And so I always uh, try to get feedback. I wanna know what the experience is like for you. I do weave that into the next listening lab. So the experience is good for the next cohort. And so there's a link to the feedback form that if you could fill out, I would be internally grateful. Um, part of why this session was so great was because the sessions before you gave me tons of feedback and I was able to use that to make our experience today so good. Um, that's the first ask feedback. Second ask, please follow us. Keep in touch. We're on a Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So if you follow our socials, like Nipur said, we try to put out free content. We'll be in touch with you. You can access us that way. And the third is to check out our how to design uh, online meetings course. I highly recommend it for people who are hosting <laughs> meetings. Uh, hopefully you'll feel the habitus difference to this meeting that when you plan for a meeting in advance, when you have someone take care of, care of tech, when you're intentional about using the great features that come with being in a virtual space, your meetings can go a lot better and you can be more effective at what you do. So now I'm gonna just do a real quick closing. If everyone wants to drop back into their bodies again, you can close your eyes, do whatever's comfortable. And part of what, uh, why we did a lab and why we had all those experiments was because we wanna have this learning that we did with listening live in our bodies so we're ready, we're with it. It's there for us whenever we need to listen again in the future. And so just take a few deep breaths, feel your body in this moment on the seat that you're on, get your feet on the ground. If you can put both feet on the ground, feel that sensation, having the earth beneath you and reflect on that takeaway, reflect on what we've learned. And what I want you all to bring into, you know, pay forward from this, what I want you to bring into your life is asking yourself the question, what could our world look like if we did more listening to for each other? What, how, how would our, the polarization we see, how would that look different when we bring this deep listening that we're cultivating in our lives um, moving forward? And so just again, be present with your breath, note the sensation. Smell is also actually one of the strongest memories of your brain. So take a whiff of that air that you're in right now. Notice the smell, attach this learning to this embodied experience. You can carry it with you. And um, when you're ready, you can open your eyes and we'll have in the chat those three asks for you. You can put in your email and then this is the time where you're welcome to leave and enjoy the rest of your evening or Nipur and I will stay for a few more minutes if there are any questions. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your listening. And I hope everyone continues the beautiful work everyone's doing on peace and justice. So thank you for the organization for hosting this. Thank you. Great meeting you all. And approach.